Hi, everyone. Um, as Sasha just said, my name is Hillary, and I am currently the director of graphic design for the Whitney Museum of American Art. Uh, prior to that, I did work at the New York Times Magazine for a number of years, and I also worked at a handful of small uh, studios and agencies, both here in New York, in Los Angeles, and also in Portland, Oregon. But regardless of what city I was in or what project I was working on, typography has always been the foundation of what I do in my practice as a designer. So um, I'm grateful to be here today as a participant, but also just to sit and listen in the audience with the rest of you. Um, but back to the Whitney. Um, for those who aren't familiar with the Whitney, we are a museum. Uh, we focus on modern and contemporary art. Um, and we're founded about 87 years ago by one person, Gertrude Vanderbilt Whitney, who herself was a sculptor. Um, and when she was practicing, almost a century ago, all eyes were on Europe. There wasn't really a lot of attention being paid to American art and that frustrated her, I think, personally, but also on behalf of all the people she was seeing, especially here in New York, um, making a lot of really interesting artwork. So she took it upon herself to start displaying and collecting the work of her peers, including such well-known names as Edward Hopper, Stuart Davis, many others. Um, and when she amassed a collection that was close to about 500 pieces, she went to the Met with the endowment and said, please take these off my hands, I want people to see them. And the Met said, no thanks. Um, so that's how the Whitney began, was her initiative um, to start a museum. So fast forward to today, we have about 22,000 works um, in our collection. And that's part of the reason, two years ago, we decided to build a new building and move downtown. Um, from around 19, I think it was 66, to about 2015, we were on the Upper East Side, an iconic Marcel Breuer building, which ironically is now being rented to the Met. Um, we <laughs> worked with Renzo Piano to create a whole new building, um, and it's, given the history of the Whitney, um, the graphic design department has only been around for about nine years. Um, I started there five years ago. Um, and when I started, there were only three members of my department, myself and two designers. Um, over the years, given the monumental nature of building a new building and all of the work that, that entails, I've been successful in convincing the Whitney that I needed more people um, to help make all this work. So we're now up to six designers, including myself. Um, I've been less successful convincing them that I need a project manager or a production manager. Um, so I rely pretty heavily on some tools, including an internal staff website, which helps mitigate all of the incoming requests. It looks like this. Um, no one really sees this. So um, the staff um, has their pick at what type of project they need to do, and then they're directed to a custom form that tries to extract as much information from them as possible so that we can kind of hit the ground running. The other thing I rely on is one really tricked out Google Doc. Um, and <laughs> this is probably the scariest piece of typography that you're gonna see in the next couple of days. Um, but this is all of our projects. We work on about 200 active projects at any given time. And dividing that up among six, that means that there's about 30 active projects happening, um, including myself. So it's a lot to get through. Last year alone, we worked on 784 projects. Um, the biggest stakeholder, uh, no surprise, is our curatorial department. We worked on 161 projects related to exhibitions, and that includes the graphics you see on the wall, any ephemera that goes with an exhibition, even down to the wall labels. Runner-up is marketing. We do a lot of work for them, including the guide that you pick up if you're on, on site, templates for emails, um, and then traditional advertising placements like subway posters. Third was the education department with 93 projects. They're in charge of all of our public programming, so things for them include activity guides for kids, programs and invitations to events, um, accessibility signage, lots of random things. Um, and then fourth was our retail department. We work very closely with them on making a lot of Whitney branded merchandise, everything from the postcards to um, anything that they can potentially think up. Last place <laughs> on the opposite end of the spectrum is the Whitney Houstons, which is our softball team. Um, we help make them <laughs> a t-shirt every year. I'm totally not kidding. There was a whole article in the Wall Street Journal on them last year, no, no joke. Um, 
Overall, we work with about 30 departments at the Whitney, aside from our own, which each of them has their own staff, their own budgets, and their own perception about how the Whitney should be kind of communicated to all of their constituents. Um, and all of that back and forth is a lot. So I counted. Um, since I started at the Whitney, I've sent over 31,000 emails, um, which a lot of that is trying to sort through how to satisfy the goals of all these different departments through all these individual projects without losing sight of kind of the overall brand of the Whitney. Um, I've also attended 3,481 meetings. I've finished five sketchbooks. I just started number six. Um, I tend to work about 10 and a half hours a day and drink four cups of coffee. Um, and all of that effort and caffeine consumed is generated all towards my two primary objectives at the Whitney, one being trying to create a space where excellent design is possible. I really want to set up my team so that they are able to put, por put forth the best solutions, and that means having enough time, enough money, and enough authority to really do that. So my role, I see it, is to advocate for good, de good design on behalf of my team to the rest of the institution, and just trying to make sure that we have what we need and educating the rest of the institution on what those ingredients are to make good design possible. Um, the second objective is to maintain the integrity and vitality of our identity system. Um, I'm sure most of you have seen it at this point. We launched it four years ago with the help of three brilliant designers of Experimental Jet Set. The foundation of that system is one typeface, and no, it is not Helvetica. It is Neue Haus Grotesque, which was designed by Christian Schwartz, who I believe is in the audience today, um, and released in 2010. We have some pretty specific specs um, for all of our display type. It's pretty tight on the tracking at negative 20% and also pretty tight in the letting at 80%. Um, and 100% of the circumstances is left aligned. Um, in addition to the one typeface, we have one mark, which is called the responsive W, and it's called that because it has infinite iterations. Um, shown here are some early invitations we did with the system, and you kind of can get a sense of how the W functions in there. Um, the idea behind it was that we as a museum, for most of our materials, we're using artworks to represent the shows that are on view, the programming we have, et cetera. And artworks come in any number of proportions. They could be tall, they could be wide, um, they could be rectilinear. Um, and what Natasha was saying earlier about all of our surfaces being rectangles kind of rang true to me because a lot of that kind of comes out in how the W behaves. So if you take an artwork and you don't crop it, you use its standard proportions, you're left with kind of an odd space that's left over. And the idea was that in deference to the art, our mark, what we use to represent ourselves, would take up that the leftover space. We would always give artwork the first billing and then use the scraps um, to represent our own identity. Um, so that's what you see here. And also, side note, we, we try and match the headline typography on whatever we're using to the word Whitney in the mark so it feels integrated and not just a logo stuck on top. Um, shown here are some early stationary pieces. Even when we don't have artwork, we try and keep the W dynamic and kind of see in the middle um, are the backs of our business cards. I insisted on printing three different ones for each box. Um, and when the right time calls for it, we can get really playful with it, like on these bottles um, for the retail department. We can break it apart, we can duplicate it, we can just push it to figure out what application works best. And in digital space, we make it move. Um, this display is really crazy right now. Um, if you've ever been to our website, you'll know that if you scroll down, the W itself compresses into um, a straight line and then disappears. Um, it was kind of a mathematical feat to ensure that the tight spacing that we have between the rule and the word Whitney was maintained at every breakpoint. And also, we make it move on our digital applications, um, such as film titles for all of our videos online, as well as the digital signs that exist outside the museum. And as the years go by and the foundation of the system um, just builds to be stronger and stronger, we've been looking for um, institutional moments to push out of that normalcy, um, to really use the, the brand to kind of recognize when times aren't just day to day. Um, so this is an example of the 2014 Biennial, which is a signature exhibition for us where we focus on emerging art. Um, 
For this, we went with a type-only system, kind of turning the word biennial into a responsive word, just like the W, and kind of overlaying it over the W in a colorful way. Um, we tend not to use a lot of color in our type, simply because given the whole idea of kind of giving the artwork first billing, when we worked on creating the identity system, we realized that when we used color type with a colorful artwork, they ended up kind of competing with each other um, in every situation, so we decided to separate those. But when there is no art, we have a little bit more leeway. So I don't know how many of you just went to our most recent biennial. It closed five days ago. Um, but we started talking about what we would do for that last summer. We had some preliminary conversations with the curators of the show to kind of figure out what, what they were feeling, what the themes of the shows were kind of starting to be, and started working on it, um, all of us as a department. So all six of us um, started generating concepts, and we created over 100 of them last summer, narrowed them down to three, I think, by September, and presented them to the two curators of the show, the head curator of the museum, the director of the museum, the chief operating officer, and probably a few other people. Um, for those who have worked for museums, you know that that's pretty normal. Um, but thankfully, among all of them, they chose one direction unanimously, which is kind of rare. Um, and it looks kind of like this. So um, this is a sample invitation um, from this year's opening events. And this year's um, biennial had, I think, about 63 artists in it. Um, but while the number of the artists may change every time we do one of these shows, and the artists themselves obviously change, the idea that the biennial is supposed to capture a moment in time, given that selection, has been consistent. Um, and kind of being inspired by that kind of notion of temporality, and also how important this show is to the Whitney, um, we were inspired to um, make what we did, which was turn the W on its side to bleed off the edges and become kind of this abstract B of a net that then captured a wide array of images. Um, this is another invitation. Uh, one of the constraints that the curators put to us was that while they wanted to use images, they didn't want one image to be the hero shot or two images to become the signature of what the show meant. They really wanted to give as many artists as possible uh, some play in all the materials we were gonna do. Um, so this system really worked well for that and worked well for any given proportions that we were um, have to work within, such as these street pole banners and also another subway platform poster. Um, and then online, we created a custom-coded digital experience where you can kind of scroll through this ongoing net of all the artists in the show. Um, at the end of the day, we ended up doing 73 unique configurations of the images. Um, and thankfully, we came up with this idea early enough to ensure that enough artists were okay with us treating their work this way. Um, so 26 artists signed a special contract um, to allow us to tilt, obscure, and overlay with lines um, their artwork. Um, and in the process of creating this system, we broke three of our own foundational rules. We never um, break apart the word Whitney from the line, we never bleed uh, the rules of the W off the page, and we never treat artworks this way. Um, rarely do we kind of stray from our system that far or that much, so it really has an impact when we do. Um, 94% of the projects we do um, fit under the umbrella of the Whitney's identity system. There's only one situation where we actually depart from it, which is exhibition graphics. Um, and I remember having some long conversations with our curatorial department before we moved into our new building, hoping that I could make the argument that because it's our building and because any show, whether it's from our own collection or traveling from another, uh, another institution, it's our show once it's on our walls and it comes with a Whitney curatorial focus and ideas about that show and that we should always use our, our typeface, our voice to kind of represent those exhibitions. Um, they weren't buying it and wanted to retain the right to use whatever typeface, whatever treatment they felt was best for their individual show. Um, but despite kind of fighting for the right to opt out, for the most part, they opt in. 81% of the exhibitions we've had in our new museum do use our house typography. Um, and I think part of that was because they were maybe afraid that, you know, they, they didn't quite see how we could use one font to represent the wide span of artists and selections of artists that we use for group 
group shows with just one font, but I actually really enjoy that challenge. So it's kind of been up to us to figure out how to do that. Um, for one exhibition, Open Plan, um, we allowed uh, five artists to kind of take over our, our biggest gallery space, our fifth floor, um, and it made sense since they were being inspired by our architecture to use our typeface. Um, we rescreened each name in black as the baton was tossed um, across the whole show, but pretty standard treatment. Same for Rachel Rose, a video artist. Her work was behind closed doors because it had to be dark, so we took advantage of the architecture itself, um, also using our house type. Um, Carmen Herrera, amazing graphic paintings. We used uh, a lighter weight of the font and kind of this duotone slash through it to kind of nod to her work. And for fast forward painting from the 1980s, we just tracked that out. Um, Dreamlands, um, a show about immersive cinema. We created dimensional letters also using our house font um, to kind of allude to the fact that maybe these letters were emerging from the wall. 19% of the exhibitions have departed from the system since we moved to the new building. Um, even though you know, I made that compromise and that agreement, I've insisted that anything we use still feel modern and contemporary. I just feel like within the architecture of our building and all of our other graphics, anything too um, outside of that would feel really out of place. So another example would be um, for Archibald Motley, a painter who did most of his work during the 20s, um, the curator of that show really wanted to use a 1920s font. Um, so we heard that, um, but still wanted to use a very modern interpretation of it, um, which is what we did. In addition to all of the exhibition graphics, we have about 137 pieces of signage throughout our building that are also set in Neuhaus Grotesque, but only one instance of the mark, those digital screens that I think I showed you a picture of earlier. That puts a lot of pressure on our type treatment to pretty much carry the institutional voice throughout our inst institution, um, which is something we've been also exploring with retail products, just seeing how we can distill that while still feeling like the Whitney. Um, so we started making some t-shirts and just using our font, our specs, and the words we use to kind of communicate who we are. Um, we made a letterpress calendar um, and my personal favorite, art criticism, page flags. Um, because who doesn't need to call out lack of gravitas um, on a daily basis? Um, I've shown you a bunch of work today and hopefully through it you've seen that um, the foundation of the Whitney's system is really typography. Um, but if you'd like to see more, there's two places you can find it. One being the museum itself, which is at 99 Gansevoort Street. Um, and the other is a website we launched at the end of last year, design.whitney.org, where it's the last five years of our work um, and counting. It's 50% photo photographs that we've taken ourselves um, and 50% photographs taken by the Whitney's visitors and shared on digital media. Um, have a look, let me know what you think, and uh, thank you very much. <laughs>